Keith, I think I'm going to hand it over to you and the speaker, and I will go off screen. Thank Very you. Good. Very good. Well, hello to all of you friends of the Quimper Geologic Society that are out there today on this windy and stormy day. It's nice to have you with us. My name is Keith. I'm one of the uh, Society's Board of Advisors. Most of you are used to seeing either Leslie, our tech gal who just uh, disappeared, or Michael Machette, who's often the face of the Society. Uh, unbeknownst, perhaps, to many of you, there's a, a group of us geologists that act as advisors to the board. I'm one of them. And if you look at our, if you're curious about who we are in the background, if you go on our website, you'll see a, a little thumbnail picture of each of us and a, a little uh, description of who we are and how we happen to be here and what our professional careers have been. But it's my pleasure today to uh, host this meeting and welcome, David. Uh, but before we get started with our lecture, I'd, I'd like to make an announcement uh, of our next talk, which will be uh, in January of 2024, and it'll be on January 13th. We will be hearing Ralph Hagerud of, from the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, I'll read you a very brief uh, portion of his abstract. Uh, Ralph will use LIDAR, topography, bathymetry, analysis of deep sea core and geochronology along the south margin of the late Pleistocene Cordilleran ice sheet to demonstrate multiple causes of ice retreat. So uh, we're going to be thinking about glaciers a lot, both this month and next month, since David's talk relies on uh, uh, post-glacial uh, geology as well. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to welcome our speaker, David Brownell. David is uh, executive director of the North o Olympic History Center in Port Angeles. Uh, and he'll speak on post-glacial paleo channels of the Dungeness River. Uh, I think this talk will be particularly appealing to our non-professional geologists in our audiences, as David really does a nice job of integrating geology with broader ecological and cultural elements in the history of the Dungeness River. So David, over to you. Awesome, thanks Keith. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And then go to slideshow mode. Uh, and then I believe I probably have to switch over. Switch to full, yep. Yep. There we go. Perfect. All righty. Uh, thanks again, Keith. Uh, yeah, so my name is David Brownell. I'm the director of the North Olympic History Center here in Port Angeles, Washington. Um, I also serve on the board of the Jefferson County Historical Society in Port Townsend. Um, and I want to acknowledge that the North Olympic History Center uh, does our work on the lands of the first peoples of the Olympic Peninsula, the Klallam, Macaw, Quileute, and Ho River tribes. Uh, we recognize the rich and important history of these tribal nations and commit our work to this tribal land acknowledgement, working together collectively to help preserve and share their histories. Um, and a lot of the material that I'm going to be covering today uh, was, was research that I did while working as the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Jamestown Skullum Tribe in Squim, um, which is sort of where all of this is based. Um, and it's it's sort of a synthesis of data that's come from different um, different anthropological, archaeological reports, uh, some geological materials that are out there available to the public. And I think I accidentally skipped a slide, but um, so to begin with, I'm gonna as as Keith was just mentioning, start with uh, the last glacial maximum, which we believe sort of ended around. 14 and a half to 14,000 years ago on the North Olympic Peninsula. Um, and I'm sure you're going to probably hear a lot more about this next month. So I'm going to tune in uh, to hear some as well. But uh, by all accounts, it seems like it was a pretty rapid ice wastage on the North Olympic Peninsula. This wasn't a slow, gradual melting of uh, the Cordilleran ice sheet. Um, this was within, you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred years, 
you went from having almost a mile of ice over the Strait of Juan de Fuca to, to ice-free water uh, out to the Pacific Ocean. So um, when you think about that in terms of a geological time scale, that's extremely fast. Uh, and when you think about it in terms of uh, there actually being humans on the landscape, which we now know to be a, a sci well-proven scientific fact, um, that there were tribes on the landscape at that time watching these drastic changes happen on the landscape. And so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of the course of time over the last 14,000 years um, since the beginning of the last ice age and how these different environmental, uh, geological, and other conditions influenced uh, where humans were living around the Dungeness River watershed and sort of how they shifted across the landscape according to those different factors. Uh, I really like this map is from uh, Randall Schalk's Evolution and Diversification of Native Land Use Systems on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, which is available to the public through the Olympic National Parks website. You can actually find a copy of this report. Um, goes into some really great detail and this map actually shows you um, the mapped extent of some of the glacial refugia that actually existed basically in this Goldilocks zone between the Cordilleran ice sheet, which was pushing south, basically uphill into the Olympic valleys. And then you had the Alpine glaciers um, coming downhill or, or the squim area north out of the mountains. And then you'd kind of this Goldilocks zone between the two um, where we know that there was actually forest, there were plants, there were probably animals living there. Um, you know, I don't know specifically of any archaeological evidence of humans in those glacial refugia, but that's not to say that it's not out there. Um, but doing archaeology in Olympic National Park on those extremely sleep, steep slopes um, with heavy vegetation coverage makes archaeology really tricky once you start to get up in the park. Um, so by about 10,000 years before present is when we believe that the North Olympic Peninsula was free of the Cordilleran glacial ice. Uh, and we see that also accounted for in climate records. Uh, so at the time of that glacial maximum to about 10,000 years before present, the temperature was colder. Um, we're not sure about the amount of precipitation. It could have varied. And for the most part, what wasn't covered by glacial ice was a, a tundra-like landscape. Um, from the pollen record, we know that it was mainly shrubs, herbs, mosses. Uh, there would have been a scattering of some lodgepole pine. Um, from the Manus Macedon site, there's also a little bit of uh, Sika spruce pollen in the mix as well. Um, so you can sort of think of it as what we see when we look towards northern Alaska today. Um, a pretty shrubby landscape with a few lodgepole pines or Sitka spruces that, you know, might get to 15, 20 feet tall if they're lucky, sort of scattered a lot across the landscape. Um, we also had some really interesting plants, soapberry, uh, prickly pear cactus, bunchberry. Uh, a lot of these plants are actually still around Squim today, and I'll talk about that towards the end of this presentation. Um, around... 10,000 to 8,000 years before present, the climate starts to shift. And that's what the diagram on the right side of the screen is showing you. And again, this is from Schalk's report. Uh, we entered about a three to three and a half thousand long, year long period where the, the climber got much warmer and drier. Um, and again, this was happening and you can see looking at this graphic happened relatively fast um, within the span of maybe 100 to 200 years you had a substantial drop in uh, precipitation and you had a substantial increase to the over two and a half degrees Celsius in temperature on the North Olympic Peninsula. That lasts for about 3000 years. And then the climate starts to shift again back into a uh, cooler, uh, moister conditions, more reminiscent to what we have today. Um, what that means in terms of uh, anthrop anthropology is when, that, when the climate shifted to those warmer, drier conditions, uh, most of Western Washington at that time actually looked like what Eastern Washington looks like today. Um, so think pretty dry, open prairie landscape with maybe a scattering of some Douglas firs, lodgepole pines, groves of Gary Oaks mixed in. Um, and this was at the time at, wit at which Gary Oaks sort of proliferated over Western Washington. Then about 7,000 years before present, 
the climate shifts back to uh, a colder, uh, wetter regimen, and you start to see the reduction in the range of of Gary oaks and a lot of those drier uh, those drier plant types, reducing them back to this core strip of prairies um, that basically follows the Puget Trough, comes over here to the uh, around Squim Dungeness Valley through the Olympic Rain Shadow, uh, west side of Whidbey Island, and then goes up and kind of covers over the southern tips of the San Juan Islands and uh, Victoria. Those prairies and those Gary Oaks were sort of the last remnant of this warmer climate period, 8,000 years before present. And the reason why they were still on the landscape when the first non-natives arrived here 200 years ago was because the tribes had actively engaged in burning regimens to keep the prairies open, to keep hemlock and western red cedar and Douglas fir, um, and even Gary oaks themselves from encroaching over and growing over these entire prairies and shading them out. Um, here, here in Squim, Whidbey Island, Port Townsend, uh, Victoria, you had the added element of the rain shadow effect, which would have meant that you know burning would have been. Um, Intentional burning wouldn't have necessarily been needed quite as much, but then you have the added factor of a lot more uh, wildfires just because of drier conditions in this area. Um, and so you actually had pretty prevalent wildfires um, even into the modern era, but you can imagine going back to this drier, warmer period that there would have been pretty catastrophic, massive wildfires occurring across the landscape. So around 7,000 years before present, Again, that climate starts to shift again, starts getting colder, starts getting wetter. At that point, uh, that's when the conifer forests close in over western Washington. So that's when western Washington, west of the Cascades, stops looking like east of the Cascades and starts looking like a solid evergreen forest over every mountain and hill. Um, that also affected where humans lived and what they were able to eat, what they hunted. Um, prior to the closing in of the forest over western Washington, um, by all accounts, what the archaeological record shows is that people were living, that the tribes were living in relatively small groups, um, scattered across the landscape, usually in uh, small villages or gatherings that were anchored around um, convergences of streams or where a stream mouth emptied out into the ocean. Um, but they tended to be orientated around terrestrial resources. They tended to be hunting large terrestrial mammals, um, deer, elk, that sort of thing. Then once the forests close in over the landscape 7,000 years ago, it starts getting a lot harder to hunt large game mammals. And a lot of those large terrestrial mammals like mastodon, uh, bison antiquus, we even had caribou here, um, disappear off of the landscape and it forces people to start shifting to more maritime resources. So salmon fishing, digging clams, um, that sort of thing that we think is more of the um, prototypical Pacific Northwest tribal lifestyle. Um, then about from 3,000 years before present is when we arrived to our onset of modern climactic conditions. Um, and obviously we're, we're entering a period where those are starting to shift again. And so I think one of the important parts of this slide is pointing out to folks that regardless of, of what your politics or what your science, when you come down to the basic brass taxes of, of the climate is changing, you can actually look at data of it's happened here before, we understand when that happened and we can actually get an idea of what sort of plants proliferated at that time, what didn't, um, and actually get an idea of what, what we need to do as a society to um, make the appropriate plans and adjustments for these coming changes. So I just went on a little rant about the funnel assemblage, but I'll continue into that. So uh, from 13,000 to 10,000 years before present, so right before that warmer, drier period began, uh, we had the late Pleistocene, what's called Rancho La Brea assemblage, which included mastodon, caribou, and bison, uh, which we all have documented at the uh, Manus, mastodon Manus Mastodon Archaeological Site, which is located in Happy Valley, a few miles south of Squim in the foothills of the Olympic Mountains. Um, and again, from Shock's report, on the leeward side of the Olympics, environmental conditions might have been quite productive of large game, 
Such resources are likely to have been relatively abundant and diverse in this that area during the late Pleistocene compared to other areas of the peninsula. Um, and what's interesting about that is in addition to the Manus Mastodon site, um, we've got the Squim Bypass site, we've got the Slab Camp site, and we've got the Little Quilcene site, which are just four that I can rattle off the top of my head, Olcott Assemblage archaeological sites. Uh, Olcott Assemblage is, is one of the older cultural traditions that we even have here in Washington State. Um, and that's a specific type of, uh, of lithic or stone technology. Um, but again, that's going back to the end of the last ice age. So uh, we know we, we have clear archaeological evidence that from the exact point that the last ice age ended and that ice was gone, basically as those ice sheets retreated north, animals arrived on the landscape, moving from the south farther north, taking advantage of the new plant resources, and humans were following them into that landscape. Um, the image on the right side of your screen, um, this is the this is a really cool uh, a collage that this guy put together of all of the North American Holocene fauna. And what I've actually done is I've gone through and circled uh, everything that's circled in red is still extant on the Olympic Peninsula, which kind of gives you an idea of the amazing biodiversity that we still have in this amazing place that we live. Because um, there's few places where this many animals would still be circled uh, in that color. Um, circled in yellow are animals that um, either in the case of mountain goats were introduced to the Olympic Peninsula or in the case of coyotes have arrived um, in the last basically 60 years since gray wolves were extirpated. So they're, they're species that are native to North America that can or could be found on the Olympic Peninsula but are not native to the Olympic Peninsula. So giving you an idea of how quick the biodiversity has shifted out here just in the last 60 years since gray wolves were wiped out. The last gray wolf um, was killed in the Olympic mountains in the 1960s. You'll notice I have a red dotted line around gray wolves um, because they're on their way back out here. So in, in 2017, we had our first documented um, breeding pack, which is really just a breeding pair of gray wolves west of the Cascade Crest. Um, at that time, WDFW, I believe, was predicting that it was going to take about another five to ten years for us to get a, another breeding pair west of the I-5 corridor. That's kind of the next big um, natural boundary that they have to get past. Once there's a breeding pair west of the I-5 corridor, the Olympic Peninsulas are going to get repopulated with gray wolves really quick. Um, and there are some people who would talk to you who have spent some time in the Olympic Mountains who believe they have seen evidence of solitary gray wolves um, deep in the Olympic mountains, which um, is not beyond belief because if you know anything about gray wolves, they, they will roam hundreds, if not thousands of miles every year. Um, so if you've ever looked at a traffic, it, it's totally possible that there may already be one or two loners out in the Olympic mountains, but they'll be back here, um, you know, within another human generation or two, um, we'll probably have another healthy population of gray wolves protected on the Olympic Peninsula. And again, that's going to start to shift everything again, because we've now gone 60 years where our Roosevelt elk and black-tailed deer populations have gone without wolf predation. And if you read historic accounts, especially of the Squim Dungeness Valley and the Squim Prairies, um, they were almost overrun with wolves. The, the Jamestown Squalum had strong ancestral ties to the wolves. Uh, the village of Stukwing has a wolf ancestor story. Um, and in their stories, you know, they all have hundreds to thousands of wolves running around the prairie. So um, I could go on about that all day. Also circled in this, uh, you'll see circled in green are animals that um, we do we have excavated remains of them on the Olympic Peninsula. I've got a Columbian mammoth uh, circled and a bison antiquus. I've circled those in green as in we have evidence. We do have scientific evidence of them on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, either before or after the last ice age. We do not have direct evidence of humans hunting or interacting with those animals. So we know they were here. I don't have evidence of humans hunting mammoths. I do have evidence of uh, humans hunting mastodons. So it kind of gives you an idea in the different coloration. So uh, again, going back to that climate shift, 
ten thousand to you know six thousand six to seven thousand years before present, that warm, dry climate shift results in high densities of large herbivores. Uh, species diversity was reduced. That's when you start to see uh, deer and elk really become prevalent across the Olympic Peninsula in really large numbers. And that's also when you start to see salmon and that and anadromous fish resources getting established in most of the rivers of the Olympic Peninsula. So basically, we know that it took a few thousand years after the rivers on the Olympic Peninsula became ice free for them to actually have um, healthy returning salmon populations that were probably migrating up from streams far farther to the south. Um, then again, 6,000 to seven to 3,000 years before present, that shift in the climate to, to being uh, colder, wetter, results in the closing of the forest, which reduces the amount of landscape carrying capacity for large herbivores. That reduction in productivity of terrestrial resources makes the uh, and marine resources like salmon, marine mammals, and shellfish increasingly important to the tribes of the peninsula. Also at this time, she, sea level was fluctuating a lot. Um, and I'm not gonna go on a whole lot about this to a bunch of geologists, because I know you guys probably know a lot more about this than I do. Uh, but essentially at the last glacial maximum, when there was three to 4,000 feet of ice sitting on top of Squim and Port Townsend, that was an immense amount of weight pressing down on the crust of the earth. And as soon as that ice, and as we talked about earlier, that, that ice wage stage was relatively fast. So you know, when you think about in 1500 years, that immense amount of weight being lifted off of the tectonic crust, that rebound starts to happen. Um, and so what you've actually had is different corners of the peninsula shifting over the last couple thousand years, kind of in a seesaw action over time. Uh, and what's really interesting about this is a um, couple things. About four and a half to 3000 years before present sea levels were within two to three meters of our current sea level. And then about 2000 years before present sea level reaches its modern conditions. This jibes with the fact that we don't really find coastal archeological sites, which are called shell middens um, right along the shoreline that are much older than 2000 to 2500 years before present because those older sites would now be inundated underwater. Um, and when we think about where people live, they tend to live in coastal situations. Um, and so for a long time, there's a misconception that um, Native Americans have only been in North America for about 13,000 years, because that was the date of uh, some sites in, in New Mexico and Wyoming, the Clovis site, you've probably heard in the Clovis theory, which are these large lancelet uh, spear points that were used for hunting mastodons. And that was the, the going th hypothesis for a very long time was that was the oldest culture. We now know that that's not true through many lines of evidence, archeological evidence, genetic evidence. Um, there were multiple waves of migrations of what we now call Native Americans from the old world, from Asia into North America. Um, some of those actually, you know, we call them migrations and that gives us the idea that people were, were constantly moving as they left Asia into North America. We now know that there was actually a period of time where they spent between 10 to 20,000 years in a land mass that's called Beringia, that's now the Bering Strait, and it's now under hundreds of feet of water between Alaska and Russia. They moved into North America from Beringia down the coast of North America, probably using boats and or canoes, um, uh, hunting marine mammals, utilizing marine resources. Again, those sites would now be under 300 feet of water. So it makes sense that for a very long time, there wasn't a lot of archaeological evidence that goes back to those dates. Um, and I won't go into that too long, but it, there's lots of archaeological evidence now and lots of archaeological uh, sites that go back well beyond 20,000 years before present. And so the whole time that that's going on and the whole time these ice sheets are moving, you know, north and south with the fluctuating climate, um, there's people on the landscape experiencing those changes uh, and adapting with them um, and overcoming them. Uh, and so... We, we live in this interesting place on the Olympic Peninsula where we have archeological evidence like the Manus Mastodon site 
um, and these other Olcott sites that are up in the foothills and are these small hunting camps. What we don't have archaeological evidence of is, say, like large villages, food production centers, that thing going back 10,000 years ago. Well, if we had those, those are now underwater. So getting into more specifically the Dungeness watershed, it's a very short river. It's just over 30 miles long from its headwaters to Dungeness Bay. And in that course, it drops over a mile, 6,400 feet, making it one of the steepest rivers in North America. I can't find exact statistics. I find things that keep saying it's the second steepest river in North America, but I can't confirm that. So I'm not gonna say it for sure. Uh, it drains 270 square miles, and the majority of sediment transport and subsequent channel change occurs during flood flows, which take place right now during winter. Um, we actually just had one of our big flood flows on the Dungeness River this past week with that. We got like two inches of rain in, in like three days, um, and it was pretty wild to watch the Dungeness go from a pretty small stream to a raging current in, in just a few hours. So I'm going to look at a couple different sets of data, um, geological, archaeological, and then I'm going to dive into some Squalum oral history accounts and um, some of the things that the, the tribal histories can tell us about what was happening over the landscape. On the right side of your screen, you can see a map. The pink triangles are actually different uh, New Squalum or Squalum village sites located across the coast. And then the red ovals that you see are actually some of the archaeological sites that I'm going to talk about that are associated with some of these paleo channels. And we're going to start uh, with the Bell Creek paleo channel, which is the oldest. Um, and again, talking, I, I don't usually give this presentation to a bunch of geologists, so I, I feel a bit out of sorts reading this off to you guys, <laughs> preaching, preaching to a choir. Um, but essentially, as you move downstream down these paleo channels, the cobble size decreases. Um, the the Olymp, as I just mentioned, that because the Dungeness River is so steep and short, it's essentially just a giant water saw, rip saw, that's just you know gutting the Olympic Mountains and all of these cobbles, silt, rocks, all this stuff is getting flushed out in these massive floods, and then it's all getting dumped over the Squim Dungeness Valley into this massive alluvial plain. And so much material is getting deposited in the river channel that it's constantly causing the river channel itself to shift over the landscape. Um, what's cool is because of some of the archaeological work that's been done on some of these sites that I'm going to talk about, we actually have dates um, that bookend when some of these channels were occupied by the Dungeness River. And then some of these other dates, as you can see by my copious use of question marks, are just that. Um, but we can infer, you know, some some rough estimates on, on when the river was in certain locations based on um, different archaeological deposits. And so the oldest oldest channel is Bell Creek, which is the farthest south you can see in the bottom right corner of that map. Um, according to Brian Collins, the Greater Dungeness River area was ice-free by about 12 and a half thousand years before present, um, and possibly coincident with this deglaciation and definitely following it, the Paleo Channel of the Dungeness River incised into these uh, glacial marine deposits. And there's actually, I think it's in another slide or two, there's evidence that the the, the earliest uh, post-glacial Dungeness River may have actually been flowing basically against the base of, if not glacial ice, then remnant ice that was left behind in blocks by the glacier. So the, uh, it's kind of hard to see on this map, but uh, in the bottom right quadrant of the map, you'll see there's two archaeological sites, one called the Manus site, and then just above that, 45CA426. That's an archaeological site designation. That's the Squim Bypass site. The Squim Bypass site was excavated when Highway 101 Bypass was put in just south of Squim. 
And that site's located roughly where the Squim Avenue and Highway 101 bypass is. So it kind of gives you an idea where we're talking about um, location-wise. So they, when they excavated that archaeological site, they also did radiocarbon dates. And those radiocarbon dates, based off of um, uh, peat layers, were dated to uh, 6,780 years before present, give or take 60 years. Um, and then over top of the peat layer was a layer of Mazama ash from Mount Mazama, Crater Lake, Oregon, which erupted 6,300 years before present. So that indicates that the Paleo Dungeness River that was flowing through the Bell Creek Channel abandoned that channel by about 6,700, 6,800 years before present at the very latest. Um, so the Dungeness River basically from the end of the last ice age for about five to 6,000 years flowed through the Bell Creek Channel. Uh, what's really cool about the Squim Bypass archeological site. Um, so this is showing you in red that Dungeness River Paleo Channel and then uh, where the, the bypass site is, there's two components to that archaeological site. And the older component, which is located on the south side of the, the channel, so the uphill side, you can see if you look just below that red line, so to the south of it, there's a terrace. And so up on that terrace was where the older component of this archaeological site was. Um, and it was a late uh, Holocene hunting camp it was occupied, and again, we don't have radiocarbon dates, so our dates are comparing stone tools found at this site to stone tools found at other sites where we do have dates. But we think comparatively that that hunting camp was occupied from 4,000 to 8,000 years before present. Um, so again, thinking about a, a few slides back, that would have been the time at which we were starting to shift from having um, basically the really large terrestrial herbivores over the landscape, shifting to having lots of uh, herds, large herds of deer and elk on the prairie. And so this was a hunting camp that was used primarily for hunting those deer and elk out on the Squim Prairie. Um, then what's cool is then there's a, a more recent component that's actually down on the alluvial fan, actually down next on the Bell Creek alluvial fan. So it's right next to the creek. That more recent component we actually do have radiocarbon dates for. And it was occupied from uh, 2,400 years before present to 170 years before present. And it doesn't take a lot of guessing to figure out what happened 170 years before present that stopped those hunting traditions that had been happening since time immemorial on the Squim Prairie. Um, it was the arrival of non-natives in an agricultural society that blocked off large parts of the prairie as private property and no longer allowed the tribes to engage in their traditional practices. Uh, so the position of the Bell Creek Paleo Channel in relation to the discontinuous ridge of stagnant ice contact sediment suggests that it, this channel was for at least a time ice marginal, um, which is pretty cool to think about the Dungeness River flowing along the base of the glacial ice at the end of the last ice age. As the Cordilleran ice sheet melted and perhaps in response to isostatic uplift, the river sh shifted in the Bell Creek Paleo Channel to a lower position or positions on the Squim Coastal Plain, such as the Girin and Castellari Paleo Channels eventually occupying its present valley. And again, when you see the river in full flood state rolling these giant boulders down, um, and it's it's actually cool, if, if you're ever in Squim during a flood stage, and you can go down to the Dungeness River, um, Dungeness Nature Center, and go down to the Dungeness River Bridge and just stand out there, and if it's quiet, you'll actually hear the boulders clacking under the water as they get rolled down the river. So enough high energy volume comes down, rolls enough of those boulders up and creates essentially a dam and that shifts the river over to these new channels. So the second the second channel, again, and it's, it's kind of cool if you hold your right hand out in front of your face, your five fingers can kind of represent the paleo channels, right? So your pinky finger is Bell Creek, then you've got Gearin, then you've got Castellary, then your index finger is Meadowbrook Creek, and your thumb is the current alignment. So you can kind of think about the Dungeness River shifting over those five alignments over the last 13,000 years. So going to the second one, Gearin Creek, we know it shifted um, based on those dates from 
that we talked about earlier with the Mazama ash and the peat layers shifted into the Gearing Creek channel about 6,700 6, to 6,800 years before present. Uh, and you can see again, using the this LIDAR imagery, uh, this you can actually see the, the perfect 100 meter wide floodplain you know, now these these creeks are very small. They're usually dry in, in our summer months. Um, but if you look at it on LIDAR, you can still see the old river floodplain. And it's almost always exactly 90, 90 to 100 meters wide, you know, as you follow these across the landscape. So I just love using this LIDAR as a tool. Um, so one interesting note, well, two interesting notes. If you look at this, uh, the, this figure in the top left with the longitudinal profiles, you'll see first off the Bell Creek Paleo Channel uh, is actually at a much steeper grade than these other uh, these other Paleo channels. And there's actually it's uh, Brian Collins and uh, Shock both theorized that the Bell Creek Paleo Channel appeared to be graded to a lower sea level. Which makes sense, you know, when the river was flowing through that channel 10,000 years ago, as we were talking about a couple slides ago, the sea level would have still been anywhere from 30 to 50 meters lower than what it is today. So you can think about, for example, Squim Bay, which is now a bay, at that time would have been a valley with probably a shallow lake or a small pond at the bottom. There would have been a creek draining out of that valley that would have met up with what was then the Dungeness River flowing out through what's now the Washington Harbor Lagoon. And those actually probably would have met up and had a confluence under what's now the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, another cool note from this figure, you can see uh, the Girin and Casselieri Paleo Channels. Um, the grades actually they cross and uh, that means that there is a potential that uh, portions of the Girin and Castellary creeks may have been active simultaneously. So uh, basically at, you know, sometime around 5,000 years before present, the Dungeness River might have split and half of it flowed through the, the what's now the Girin Creek Channel and the other around the Castellary Creek Channel um, with uh, the pothole, what's now called the potholes, which is a ridge kind of right in the middle. This is interesting to think about. Um, and so this is kind of showing you those hills. You can see where every time the river shifts, it's incising these channels through these glacial sediments and kind of leaving. Um, here's the, the, can you guys see my cursor? Can anybody give me a thumbs up if you guys can see my cursor? Okay, so you can see the these these lumpy things, we call these the potholes. Uh, and again, those are those were just formed when the, that glacial ice was melting on the landscape and those are kettles on these gravel ridges located just to the north of Squim. And the river was cutting its way around these different ridges and, and sediments. Um, so again, I don't have an exact date of when uh, the Castellary Creek, when the Dungeness River would have started flowing through the Castellary Creek uh, Paleo Channel, um, but there is an archeological site 45 CA 433, which is located on a terrace just over this channel which we have radiocarbon dates going back to about 4,000 years before present. Um, and so again, you know, that's sort of jumping to a conclusion, but to me, it makes sense that they would have started occupying that, that archeological site at the time when the river was flowing right there below it, providing the resources they needed. Um, and then the most recent, and this is pretty cool, because this is, this is, in terms of geological history, this is a split second ago. Um, in 1855 is actually when the Dungeness River shifted into its current alignment from the Meadowbrook Creek Channel. So for those of you who are familiar with the Squim Dungeness area, if you're on Squim Avenue and you drive north to Squim and you keep going north a couple miles, you arrive at the town of Dungeness. And if you stay on Squim Dungeness Avenue, instead of turning off and going into the little town of Dungeness, you can stay on Squim Dungeness Avenue and it's, it starts to shift northwest and there's the old Dungeness schoolhouse and the bridge goes over the Dungeness River. And this is just south of the mouth of the Dungeness. So um, if you look at this, uh, 
This is from Brian Collins, uh, Historical Geomorphology and Ecology of the Dungeness River Delta and Nearshore Environments from the Dungeness Spit to Washington Harbor. It's not doesn't roll off the tongue, but um, I know since this, this is a group of geologists, I will tell you this report is available online. You can Google it. And it's absolutely fascinating. Um, I've read it a dozen times, and every time I pick it up, I learn more about the history of the Olympic Peninsula. Um, this image is from his report. And again, this is just showing you uh, elevations where the highest elevations are blue, the lowest elevations are red. Uh, and you can see this the QGD, these uh, glacial sediments, this ridge of glacial sediments that comes uh, from the west to the east. And the Meadowbrook Creek Channel, the Dungeness River, when it was in the Meadowbrook Creek Paleo Channel, flowed east around the edge of that ridge and then north into, into Dungeness Bay. Then sometime around 1850 to 1855, the Dungeness River actually managed to break through that ridge, probably during some sort of a flood event, um, and basically isolated the Meadowbrook Creek channels. So now you've got all of these oxbows in this creek that's left separate from um, the main drainage. And actually right now, a big part of what um, the Department of Ecology and actually Clallam County and uh, the Jamestown Scallam tribe, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, there's a lot of work going on to restore a lot of this floodplain down here to the south of this ridge. Um, but all of this happened in the 1850s. Um, what's absolutely fascinating about that is that's actually also recorded in the oral history of um, the Jamestown Scallum tribe. They have stories about the river shifting and then actually that resulted in the temporary, um, the temper ending of, and I can't remember off the top of my head which species it was, but a certain anadromous species, a certain salmonid was basically that run was cut off when that shift happened. And it was like nine or 10 years before it might've been pinks. There's a, before a certain salmon species returned to the Dungeness river because of that instance happening. <clears throat> uh -oh, I'm stuck. Um, and so again, talking about the cultural significance of these paleo channels, um, you also key into that when you start looking at the actual um, geophysical locations of where those villages were placed. And you'll notice when they're mapped out, they're all next to either a current or former mouth of the Dungeness River. Um, number ones, two and three, uh, Tzatzich, Tzetzkat, and Statithlum were all historic uh, Squalum village villages occupied through the late 1800s. Um, of special note to what we're talking about today, the village of Statithlum. Uh, Statithlum was also the name of the chief of the village. Statithlum was the grandfather of Chief Chichmahan or Chetsamoka um, of the Chetsamoka Trail fame. Um, so Statithlum and then his father was also named Statithlum. They had a village that was located just east of the mouth of the Dungeness River, um, was by all means the one of, if not the largest, um, slalom villages, one of the most productive in terms of um, the most prestige, the most wealth, um, owned the most slaves, had the most people in the village. Then, coincident with the Dungeness River shifted away from that village site, from so so the Statithlum village was right at the mouth of the Meadowbrook Creek Dungeness River Paleo Channel when the river flowed through that channel. When the Dungeness River shifted out of the Meadowbrook Creek Channel to its current alignment, is when Chief Chichmahan got his village of Statithlum, packed everybody up, and moved them to Katai, where Port Townsend is today, met Petty Grove and Hastings at Katai hammered out an agreement with them to share the land around Katai with these new non-natives who are arriving because he saw the economic opportunity that was arriving with them. Um, and so it's, I just go on this whole tangent because you can see how geological processes force human actions, which result in these different histories that we can account for today. And that's how 
Cheech Mahan ended up in Kitai and starting the village of Kitai where Port Townsend was, was because the Dungeness River literally shifted away from his village of Statiflum. So it took the resources away from the village. So he took the village and moved it to where there were more resources. Um, number four on this map is the actual settlement of Jamestown. Um, and you'll notice, you know, obviously the, the Dungeness River wasn't flowing through those channels um, when they formed the village of Jamestown in 1874. But the, the Jamestown Swallow and their ancestors, because they had practiced agriculture, they were keenly aware of how good the soil was down between the Castellary and Gearing Creek Paleo channels. You've got deep, loamy, nice floodplain soils. Um, you can dig down there for hours and, and be hard pressed to find a single cobble. Versus if you dig in my backyard where I live just a few miles south and swim, it's literally nothing but cobbles. Um, so it was very intentional that they placed their village site there in 1874 and they formed a farming community there. Um, moving uh, farther south, number five was the village of Shikwing. Uh, which was a, a Squalum village occupied for at least the last five to 600 years. Um, the last uh, tribal elder who um, actually grew up out there just passed away uh, this last year, Dave Purser. Um, so very, very recent and tribal uh, memory. That's where Battelle uh, Marine Science Laboratory is located today. Uh, and again, that village site was located right next to the mouth of the Bell Creek Dungeness River Paleo Channel. Um, this map is showing you some uh, Squalum toponyms. So uh, the red, uh, the red blobs or the red circles shapes, those are prairies. And um, you can see the names in white over those red blobs. Those are the names of those specific prairies. The words that you see in red are the names of the actual villages. And then you can see highlighted in blue are wetlands. And there were actually some, there were thousands of acres of wetlands around um, the Swim Dungeness Valley pre-contact. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, what's happened to them is uh, due to all of the hydro modification, most of these wetlands are gone. So we we spoke in detail about the Squim Bypass site, again, was located right here on this alluvial flan and this little wetland of uh, Bell Creek. That's gone now since the highway's been put in. Um, up here in Happy Valley, this is where the Manus Mastodon site is. That wetland is now all farmland. Um, the Gearin Creek wetland, you know, this is now a, a duck hunting club that's owned by Gray's Marsh Farms. Castellary Creek, there's a little bit of wetland left, but most of that has been drained off and ditched. Um, so unfortunately, Squim's lost a lot of our wetlands, but you can imagine 200 years ago, especially in somewhere like Squim, where we are in the rain shadow of the Olympic Mountains and we get less than 19 inches of rain per year, how incredibly important of a resource wetlands were on a landscape uh, for the tribe. And so a lot of the sites that I've been talking about and a lot of these villages that I've been talking about um, were located not only closely in association with um, these river and creek channels, but also the prairies and also these wetlands. So you can sort of think of this these webs of resources and the tribes locating their villages and camps in the, the locations that give them the best opportunities to, to harvest those resources and take advantage of them. Um, another thing that I always like to point out, so on what was formerly the last map, the prairies outlined in red, on this map they're outlined in yellow. What's outlined in yellow, those are what were mapped as prairies according to the general land office, the GLO, which was mapping specifically with the intention of having the landscape um, um, sold off and used for agricultural uh, and development purposes. However, when you actually read written accounts, the Squim Prairie was, was much more vast than what the GLO maps account for. And so according to James Swan's account, uh, it, it, the Squim Prairie is essentially some 10 miles uh, going from Squim Bay to the bluff at the mouth of McDonald Creek, and then uh, all the way from Dungeness up to uh, the foothills of the Olympic Mountains. So 
you know, the difference is according to the GLO maps, prairies are about 12% of the area. But if you start reading historic accounts, the prairies were about 50% of the Swim Dungeness Valley was open prairie landscape. Again, covered in deer and elk and massive, massive wolf packs. Um, one other thing that I like to talk about is sort of remnant features and why these paleo channels are still important to us today. Um, one of the features that these paleo channels left on these landscapes are these um, these hill slopes or these scarps that basically as the 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 channel cut into the hills that left these um, hill slopes behind that are too steep for development. They're too steep to build a house on. They're too steep to farm. And so these become these really cool little refugia for a lot of our prairie plants and other plant species um, that are either just rare or endemic to the Olympic Peninsula. Um, our squim prickly pear cactus, which is getting very, very rare. Uh, so this is a, a list of plant specimens collected by George Neville Jones in the squim area between 1931 and 1937. The ones that I've highlighted in, in pink on this list are ones that he collected on what he called gravel banks which I believe to be these hill slopes overlooking these paleo channels, um, primarily because that's where I still find these species. And it's actually the only place, um, and, and unfortunately in Squim, it's the only place where you can find these species anymore. Um, this is one, this is the last remnant of the Sporcine Prairie just south of, of where I live. And you can see on the left side of the this photo, You've got a cottonwood, a grand fir, you've got Douglas firs, you've got Gary oaks. Um, you've got just such a random assemblage of <laughs> plants that typically grow in very, very different environments. But these hill slopes, um, not only are they sort of refugia from development, um, but they've also got these interesting hydrodynamics going on. So you've got little springs and seeps coming out of parts of these slopes that can support cottonwoods and grand firs and noble firs and trees that might like wetter feet than necessarily Gary Oaks or um, beaked hazelnut. So uh, just really cool to kind of see this whole assemblage come together in these strips, um, these kind of green belts that are across the swim landscape. Those are all of my sources. Um, I'm not going to leave those up for super long, but if people are into those, they can check out the recording and just pull this screen up. And um, these are some of the programs that I'm going to be doing this year. Uh, you can find more information about these programs on our website, northolympichistory.org, uh, on our Facebook page. Um, if you're interested in becoming a member, I would highly encourage anybody uh, who's interested in more of this sort of material and becoming a member. Um, I do lots of programs. If you're a member, you get our absolutely amazing newsletter. Uh, you get discounts on a lot of these programs that we do, uh, discounts on the books that we sell, um, and lots of other cool stuff. So uh, a lot of these uh, tours and programs, you can find information on our website. We sell the tickets through our website and a website called Eventbrite. Um, and the two at the end, um, the Blinn History Hike and the Port Williams History Hike are partner programs with the Jefferson County Historical Society there in Port Townsend, and they manage all of the ticketing for those two programs. Um, so I will stop there and stop sharing the screen, and then I'm happy to take questions and a sip of water. Keith, you want to unmute start. yourself? Unmute. There right. you are. We've we've got a couple. Uh, David, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, we've got a couple questions in the chat uh, that are essentially the same. Uh, wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on uh, causes for the shifting in the of the channels over time. I think it's probably related to sea level rise and fall. But uh, if you could go into that a little bit. So, so the, and it's, it's still true to this day. The main reason why the Dungeness River shifts so much is because it's, it's such a steep river with such high energy, um, such high energy action coming down slope. It's moving all of these massive big cobbles and boulders, uh, materials out of the mountains 
Um, and those then as, as the river comes out of the mountains and it starts to lose velocity and lose energy, those larger cobbles and materials are deposited in the floodplain. They build up, essentially forming a, a natural dam or a barrier, which then forces the river to shift its alignment away from that material. So it's essentially, it's a giant rip saw pulling material out of the mountains, piling them up in the river channel and then shifting over into new channel, filling that channel up and then shifting again. And it's always doing that. And so that's one of the reasons why there's so much work going on now to restore the floodplain of the Dungeness River was because from the late 1800s through up to about the 1980s, the main strategy for dealing with this high energy, high velocity river was to channelize and channelize and channelize it to stop floods from happening. Well, all you're doing is increasing the velocity and energy of that river. And so it got to the point where by the 1960s and 1970s, they were literally running excavators and cats down into the river and digging huge pits in the riverbed, removing all of that material and then leaving a pit in the riverbed so that during the next flood stage, instead of all of that material, the river bringing material down building that up and then shifting channels, all of the material that the river brought out of the mountains got dumped into that pit. And then they would wait until the, the next dry season and they'd run the excavators back down into the riverbed and dig another giant pit. And apparently it only took a couple decades of them doing that every single year to realize that that wasn't going to be an efficient or long-term solution to the issues with the river. So now what the tribe the Conservation District, the Land Trust, the Army Corps, all of these groups are doing is slowly acquiring property and moving those levees and dikes back and letting the Dungeness River start to reconnect to some of these old channels, some of this old floodplain, and giving it that ability to, to be more flexible across the landscape so that when we have these big rain events like we had just a week ago, uh, it was really cool to see the river the Dungeness River connected to the new the what was formerly the parking lot to the Dungeness River uh, the Dungeness River Center was an old floodplain that just got reconnected and now the river is flowing through that again. So it, it's basically just a giant rip saw moving material out of the mountains, piling that up, and then just shifting around that material. Um, Thanks for that. David, if for, for some of the you folks uh, that would like to see firsthand some of the evidence of the type of thing that David's talking about, if you go to that science center, it used to be called the Audubon Center in Squim, uh, north uh, west of Squim. It's on the river, and there's a nice new facility there, and there, it's where the railroad bridge is. Um, if you walk out to that railroad bridge and look down before you get right over the river, you'll see abandoned channels. You'll see these big sand banks. You'll see these gravel deposits and so on. They're not the big boulders that David's talking about because those, of course, were left further upstream. But this is the downstream example of that. But you can see an abandoned channel there and, and, and visualize how easy it would be for the river to reoccupy that channel. It's a good place to go and, and look around and see that sort of thing. I had a question about beaver, um, which is a great question that I wish I had a better answer to. Um, I have I have dealt with some uh, faunal remains in the archaeological assembly. We have, we have some beaver bone in archaeological assemblages, but that's honestly about the extent of my knowledge in terms of beaver in this area. I haven't read anything. Um, you know, I, I don't, I should just say, I don't, I don't know about beavers. <laughs> um, when did the ice finally disappear, like at the potholes and allow the subsequent creeks to just flow straight north? Um, well, so again, it was, it was a pretty catastrophic melting process that happened. And so instead of like one long sort of gradual melt and things going to the north you can think of 
much like what we're seeing in the Arctic and Antarctic today in terms of the, the calving of these massive icebergs that then break off of the main ice sheet and flow off, you can think about something similar happening in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, you know, big chunks of ice flowing back, falling into the salt water, getting shipped out to the Pacific Ocean. Likewise, the Alpine glaciers in the Olympic Mountains would have started retreating back into the mountains. Um, we know there's there's evidence. Um, the the Manus Mastodon site that I've been talking about a lot in Happy Valley. Um, and it was actually that big wetland south of, of Squim that I talked about on one of those slides. That wetland was actually a bog that resulted from a massive chunk of ice just being left stagnant in place and melting in place. And that would have occurred across this landscape. Not all of that ice melted at one time. There were big blocks left in different places, um, you know, different different blocks of that glacial ice would have had more or less material inside of them in terms of, you know, boulders, silt, gravels, that sort of stuff as they're melting. And so they would have left um, different evidence. Um, so the potholes specifically, I believe those to be sort of evidence of solution holes, um, you know, where, where certain uh, materials could drain out of the glaciers much faster than other materials could. Um, and at that time, you know, the creeks, they would have probably been small creeks. There's, there's some interesting reports that talk about, and there's not much evidence there, but, you know, obviously there would have been a Dungeness River prior to the last glaciation. Um, and so there is a little, you know, there is some curiosity as to whether or not some of the creeks around the Squim Dungeness area, and, and now I'm speaking more to the west of the Dungeness River, so think um, McDonald's or Siebert Creek, if those creeks are actually, you know, what are now creeks are, are possibly evidence of, of previous Dungeness River alignments prior to the last glaciation or, or previous, because there's been you know, what, a couple ice ages, um, and that the river, you know, would have been there before and after each of these ice ages shifting according to different conditions. Um, are there current efforts to restore, replace these native prairies and wetlands? Yes, uh, the land trust and the tribe are both working on prairie restoration. Um, I mentioned the the large, the I believe it's called the, I should know this, I worked on it. Um, the Lower Dungeness Ecosystem Restoration, I believe is the name of the large project um, around the, the sort of the, um, that Meadowbrook Creek floodplain area um, and sort of in that whole area, the, the land trust and the tribes are working to, to restore that floodplain. Um, in the diagram of animals that occupy the peninsula, it appear that larger animals were on the margins and not present. So that I should be clear, that diagram was not animals. The animals that I circled were ones on that we have evidence of on the Olympic Peninsula. The the diagram of of a as a whole was just animals that were in North America. I hope that answered that question. Um, Looks like LIDAR, looking at the LIDAR further south, it looks like the Dungeness could have flowed into the south end of Squim Bay. Um, it would have been, it would have had to go up over Burnt Hill and reached into Palo Alto. Um, so that's not to say that it never did, but I believe that would have been, you know, pretty far back a couple ice ages ago. Um, the, the Dungeness River Valley is, is pretty incised. I mean, it's almost a canyon at points, so... I believe it's been in its current alignment for for at least probably the last couple ice ages, but that's just me theorizing. Any other questions? Don't forget, Tim, oh. that the that the um, the shape of um, Squim Bay would have been changed quite a bit as sea level rose and fell. Um, coyotes are that not native to the Olympic Peninsula. Yep, yeah. that's uh, 
Coyotes, coyotes have expanded their range exponentially since gray wolves were wiped out through more, most of North America. Um, gray wolves, um, coyotes were primarily just on the Great Plains, and they're actually called Plains wolves, um, was one of the names that the tribes had for them, or prairie wolves. Uh, and it wasn't until gray wolves got wiped out on the eastern and, and western seaboards that coyotes moved out of the plains and into gray wolf habitat. Um, yep. Are there maps of the supposed dry land of Beringia? Yes, there are. It's spelled B-E-R, um, like Bering, uh, B-E-R-I-N-G-I-A. And if you just Google Beringia spelled like that. There's some amazing, amazing reports out right now um, that talk about not only like that landmass, but now they actually have gone through and they've chased genetics to which groups spent how long in Beringia before moving into North America. And some groups actually moved from Asia into Beringia and then back into uh, Eurasia. So check it out. All right. Well, I think we'll call an end to the questioning. And uh, on behalf of the society, David, thank you very much for a most enlightening talk. I, I think it's refreshing that too often uh, we professional geologists are, are pretty narrow in because we're so fond of rocks, it's hard for us to talk about anything but rocks. So it's nice to see uh, an integration of geology with other cultural features and um, ecology and animals and all that stuff <laughs> thank you very much we've appreciated well, it's, having you it's with nice us. to talk about rocks to people who appreciate rocks <laughs> <laughs> thank you again yeah thanks for having me yeah. good night everybody oh that was really good <laughs>